Welcome once again to Mysterious Chicago. This is Adam Seltzer. We're just a few days away from our big H.H. Holmes tour on the Unsolved Mystery Tour. Um, and also, you know, it's right around the 100th anniversary of the discovery of the Fool Killer submarine, the, re- the weird homemade submarine wreck that was found in the Chicago River in 1915. And apparently that must be in the news someplace. I'm getting a lot of webpage traffic about that thing. It's always been one of my favorite stories. It'll probably be the next podcast here. And also, MysteriousChicago.com. Come on one of the tours. I'll be talking about it at least on the Unsolved Mystery Tour this Saturday. Um, but what we're getting into today is we're going to be talking a little more about H.H. H. Holmes, our favorite antique serial murderer. This is the guy who was um, featured in Devil in the White City by Eric Larson. He's about to be in a movie with uh, Leonardo DiCaprio, directed by Martin Scorsese. He's the guy most famous for having built a building that he called the, um, he, well, he called it the Englewood property. Other people referred to it as the World's Fair Hotel down on 63rd Street. The rest of the world came to know the place as the Murder Castle. It was rigged up with hidden passages, trap doors, hidden chambers, everything thing you might need to murder a person. How many people he actually killed there, nobody's entirely sure. Estimates go anywhere from about three to three hundred. I estimate on the low end myself, but I'm just, I'm weird like that. I'm very, you know, my, my thing with Holmes for years has been trying to sort out fact from fiction. And there's a lot of weird fiction that goes around about Holmes and a lot of strange conspiracy theories. Now, I don't really get into conspiracy theories too much. I, I, I just don't think that human beings are good at keeping secrets. But obviously people pull the wool over our eyes sometimes. Um, but when we get into these grand Illuminati things that involve hundreds of hundreds of people to be complicit, I kind of tune out. But you know what? I do love a good faked death theory. That's the kind of conspiracy that you only need a few people to be in on most of the time. Now, I know some skeptics who maintain that no one has ever actually gotten away with faking their death. And that strikes me as really unlikely. I mean, we only know about the ones that got caught, obviously. I'm sure some people have, you know, set fire to the trailer park and made themselves look good and dead, and then gone off with their new name and pulled it off. And not to mention in years past when this was a whole lot easier to do. Um, But it's certainly a fact that every outlaw who dies is said to have faked it. Every high-profile death, really. And it almost never turns out to be true. Like John Dillinger, Billy the Kid, Butch Cassidy, John Wilkes Booth, all of these guys were said to fake their death. Uh, John Wilkes Booth, um, they, they dug up Jesse James a while ago to see if it was actually him, which it was. But then again, you know, they also dug up Belle Gunnis, who is another Chicago serial killer. At least she got her start here in Chicago. Uh, they dug her up out of her grave in the suburbs a while ago. She had died during a fire, supposedly. And as I understand it, they found the body but never her head, which kind of implies that, you know, she cut off her own head and quick hit it really good before she got under the piano that her body was found underneath the rest of. Uh, so they dug her up uh, some years back. We, I remember we featured it on the blog, very early days of this blog, back when I was the Weird Chicago blog. Um, I guess the results were inconclusive, but they did find some weird stuff. They found that there were a couple of children buried in the coffin with her, which were not previously known to have been in there. So... Inconclusive, but there's something weird about the whole Bell Gunnis thing. She could very, she could have faked her death. Nobody else besides her would have really needed to be involved there, after all. Um, this brings us to the theory that H.H. H. Holmes, our favorite antique multi-murderer, faked his own hanging in 1896. Um, he's most famous as a Chicago criminal, but he was arrested in Philadelphia, put on trial there just for the murder of uh, Benjamin Peitzel, and eventually hanged in May of 1896. Now, I've just come, come across a couple of really nifty articles from 1898, uh, when it was a really hot rumor around Englewood, where he lived in Chicago, uh, that Holmes was not actually dead. Now, I first became aware of this theory uh, about five years ago. And yeah, I'm definitely doing a dead milkman reference there. And when somebody sent me an email saying that it wasn't really Holmes who was hanged, it was a man named Vince Ginoble, a jail employee who disappeared from the records after the hanging. Now, this turned out to be the theory that was advanced in Bloodstains, a novel by Jeff Mudgett, who was Holmes's great-great-grandson. I, I met Jeff just a few weeks after uh, that I got that email, and I asked him about Vince, and he's, uh, when I did, he immediately told me, no, it's a work of fiction. There was a, if there was a prison employee hanged in Holmes's place, that's just how he m- imagined it might have happened, which is exactly how Devil in the White City is written, too. Uh, Eric Larson really just made up a lot of the Holmes stuff, and he's very upfront about that if you read the end notes of the book. Um, but Jeff does speculate that maybe it wasn't really Holmes who was hanged that day. This is just the kind of swindle Holmes would have pulled off. And he has been trying to have the body exhumed just to make sure it's really him. 
Now, it strikes me as unlikely that Holmes could have pulled that off. Uh, quite a number of people watched Holmes being hanged. Uh, he did have a hood on covering his face when they uh, dropped the trap door that sent him down to his death, but which was standard at the time. But not the whole time he was on the scaffold. There were, pe- you know, he did make a little speech with the hood off. There were also um, priests and jail officials and lawyers who were right there on the scaffold with him. They all would have had to be involved for him to fake this. Um, but then again. It is kind of odd that Holmes wanted his body encased in cements, which it was. The doctors gave a really quick examination of the body just to make sure that the neck was broken. Then the lawyer Samuel Roten personally made sure that the body was encased in cement per Holmes' own wishes, even though Holmes was now far too dead to keep paying him. Now, supposedly this was so nobody would rob his grave and dissect him. Uh, Medical people were apparently trying to buy his brain. And this was still the tail end of the era of phrenology, the idea that you could tell a lot about a person by the bumps and ridges on their skull. And a part of that was that having a notable skull was quite the accessory to have in your private library. It was a real status symbol for a while there. So... Also, there was a thing going around at the time. It might not have been just because of a uh, fear of dissection. There was also a thing a few years before a uh, merchant in New York, A.T. Stewart, who was sort of like the Marshall Field of New York. Uh, he died, he was buried, and his body was stolen and held for ransom. That harassed his family to no end. So a lot of notable people, guys like George Pullman, shortly after that, started getting worried that the same would happen to him and started having themselves buried encased in cement and railroad ties. So it could have just been to protect his family, though I'm not, I'm not really sure the family would have felt like paying the ransom anyway. But anyway, moving along. Remembering Holmes was a medical student, we do note from his friends when he was in medical school that he seemed to enjoy the dissecting room. So the story that he was just afraid of having his body molested does strike me as kind of strange. So the the men thing is weird. And there are a couple of articles written by people who were present at the hanging who mentioned that the guy on the scaffold wouldn't have been that recognizable to people who had only seen photographs of Holmes. So these, this isn't exactly hard evidence, but, you know, I'd say it's enough that we can exhume the body. I say go ahead, dig him up. I imagine it's going to turn out to be him in there, but like I said, I am a sucker for a d- good faked death theory. Now, here's the cool thing. Here's what I wanted to really share is I just ran into a couple of really nifty articles in the 1898 Chicago Inter-Ocean that I hadn't seen before. That was a paper that was uh, very popular in Holmes' day. Uh, you've been able, it's been on microfilm at the Chicago Library, at the Chicago Public Library for years. Parts of it started getting digitized recently. A few years ago, I, I started seeing a few years of it turning up on uh, genealogybank.com. Uh, recently, they, there started being more of it over on newspapers.com, a site that I gotta say has really stepped up its game in the last year or so. And the 1898 files, um, if you were, that makes it able to search H.H. H. Holmes stuff from 1898. Previously, I assumed they might have mentioned him in the paper a few times, but on the microfilm, all you can really do is scan through manually. And once I was able to search, uh, looked up Holmes in 1898, and it brought up a couple of articles from January of 1898 saying that the really hot rumor around town was that H.H. Uh, H. Holmes was still alive. The first one opened with this statement from a man named Robert Latimer. H.H. H. Holmes was never hanged in Philadelphia May 7, 1896, as the newspapers reported, and as people who witnessed the execution believed. On the contrary, as he was always declared, as he always declared he would do, he cheated the gallows, and today is alive and well in growing coffee in San Paranarimbo, Paraguay, South America. Now, let me get this out of the way first. As far as I can find, San Paranarimbo is not a real place. Uh, or it never, or it never even was. When I tried to look it up, I only found a few. I only found a mention in a few regional papers that were reprinting this same article. Uh, there's a similarly named place in like Amsterdam, but not in South America. I'm not a geographer, but as near as I can tell from a quick glance, this was not a real place. But here's what's really neat. Robert Latimer, the man who made this statement that Holmes was never actually executed, has a very interesting connection to Holmes. Uh, Just about two years before this article, right before his own hanging, H.H. Holmes wrote his famous confession in which he confessed to having murdered 27 people. Robert Latimer was one of the people that he confessed to having murdered. There were actually a few people in the uh, confession that were not even dead yet. Uh, One of those was Robert Latimer, who had worked as a janitor for Holmes for a while. Um, In 1894 and 1895, when Holmes was in the news, the reporters talked to Latimer a couple of times, and Latimer mentioned that Holmes was into showing him his disguises. Apparently, he had some disguises that he liked to wear around Toronto, uh, just for fun, he said. Uh, He would show him these fake beards and hats and stuff. 
So anyway, Holmes eventually, there was a, I guess it was a noted for a while, people didn't know where Robert Latimer was, hadn't seen him around in a while, and he was suggested as a possible murder victim. Eventually he turned up alive and well, but that didn't stop Holmes from confessing for murdering him. Uh, there was a few people he could confess to killing that were still alive. The 27 that he mentioned were probably an exaggeration, really. There's really only 9 or 10 that we know of. But anyway, here we are in 1898. Robert Latimer tells the Chicago Inner Ocean that H.H. H. Holmes is alive and well and growing coffee in South America. Now, let's dig a bit deeper. Latimer went on, Do I believe that Holmes is alive? I most certainly do. Within the past few weeks, letters have been received from him from by a certain railroad man who was intimately acquainted with Holmes when he lived in Englewood. In those letters, the man who received them was given instructions about some business Holmes wanted him to transact, and the whole story of how he escaped hanging was related. Moreover, I don't believe Holmes was a willful murderer. I don't believe he killed Benjamin F. Peitzel, the alleged crime for which he was convicted, nor the Peitzel children, nor, in fact, any of the persons he is charged with killing except two women. Neither of them died on his hands. They both reached out. It re they both reached their homes, one of them traveling out into Iowa. They died, however, and I suppose the law calls that murder. But what I mean is that Holmes did not deliberately murder them. Now, let's pause for a moment here. The woman in Iowa he's mentioning uh, would be Gertrude Connor, a sister of Ned Connor, who we just talked about on the blog lately. His daughter and his ex-wife, Julia and Pearl, are generally agreed to be victims of Holmes. Those are a few that are on the list of ten that we know for sure. Now, Gertrude, Ned's sister, died in the early 1890s at her home in Iowa, shortly after leaving Chicago. She had apparently been working for Holmes as well. At some point, she got upset at Holmes and said she didn't ever want to talk to him again and left town. And Holmes did confess to having killed her. But the way he told the story, she died right after she got back home. Um, the real thing is she actually died about six weeks later, and when rumors that Holmes had killed her surfaced, a doctor even released a statement saying, no, she died of heart trouble, it was totally natural causes, Holmes had nothing to do with it. But again, that doesn't always stop Holmes from confessing to people, and she's still often listed as a possible victim. But moving on, according to Latimer, uh, Holmes was able to convince the priests and the jailers that he was innocent too, which is not totally impossible. Uh, certainly his lawyer kept on thinking that Holmes was innocent, at least of having killed Benjamin Peitzel, uh, even well after Holmes died. And he goes on to point out that uh, selling that confession, uh, Latimer points out that selling the confession to the newspapers left Holmes flush with cash. Uh, we also know, I believe he died without leaving a will or anything like that, so, you know, the money must have gone somewhere. So, according to Latimer, he got the officials' sympathy and he paid them off, including the priests. And he mentioned that Holmes had a beard while he was in prison and on trial, which is true. The story Latimer tells is that Holmes grew the beard in prison, then had them procure the body of an already dead man who had a beard. Then he shaved himself right before the hanging. That was his disguise, a clean shave. So Robert Latimer goes on to say that uh, on Holmes' directions, they built a special scaffold for the hanging, eight feet high with a trap door. And the trap door was strange because, according to Latimer, in Philadelphia, people were usually hanged a little bit differently. The rope would just be attached to a weight. They would lower the weight down, and the body would just be lifted up. We actually did that in Chicago a couple of times back in the 1850s. So according to Latimer, they brought in this body resembling Holmes, uh, trimmed up the beard to be as much like Holmes as they could. They dressed him up just like Holmes, smuggled the body in, and hid it underneath the scaffold, the sides of which were enclosed and blocked from view. So when the reporters came in, what they couldn't see was just below the trap door, there, was, uh, there were two prison officials hiding there with a dead body, out of their view. So, in Latimer's account, it was a very small number of people who showed up for the hanging. Just Holmes, his attorneys, and priests, etc., stood on the trap door, and he made his little speech saying that, uh, made a little speech, and this much we know is true. He said uh, he had only murdered two women, both while performing illegal operations on them, meaning abortions. Then he said, goodbye. Now, that much we know is true. He did say goodbye or something like that. The actual accounts of what he said on the scaffold differ a little bit. Like, there's some accounts that say he said, don't bungle. Uh, he said something to the guy who was uh, putting the noose around his neck. He said something like, I'm in no hurry, take your time. The exact wording of it varies from report to report. This would have been something he just said to the guy next to him. All the reporters down below probably wouldn't have been able to hear that well. But he then said goodbye right before the trap fell. According to Latimer, when he said goodbye, that was the signal. The clergymen and the officials were standing in front of Holmes back then, blocking the view of everybody, just making it look like they were binding his arms and putting on the black hood. While this was happening, the trap door fell down silently. The noose went down, but without Holmes on it. So Holmes hopped to the side while the two guys behind the screen attached the other body to it and raised it up. 
At this point, uh, when everybody stepped away, there was a guy that they were passing off as Holmes standing there, but really he was a corpse that they were just standing up there weekend at Bernie style. And so they hanged, and so then they just hanged the dead body. By this time, Holmes was already disappeared. According to, five, according to Latimer, five minutes later, the juries examined the body and were stunned at how rigid it was, having actually been dead for some time. But they weren't allowed to examine it further, or even to remove the hood. And when the casket was taken away, the still alive Holmes was still in, was inside of it. It was placed in the vault to be buried the next day. That night, the cav- uh, cadaver, the dead guy, was smuggled out of the jail and put in the casket. By then, Holmes was already gone and hanging out in a hotel in New York, reading about his own execution. Damn. Smooth as hell. So a few days later, according to Latimer, he was on his way to Paraguay and sending for a couple of women that he had reportedly killed but were really still alive presumably Minnie and Anna Williams, to come and live with him on his coffee plantation. So that was the story. They had pulled the old switcheroo and actually hanged a body that was already dead. Holmes was had taken off. All, all, in, the, all in full of view appeal. It does sound like the kind of trick that a magician could pull off. And Latimer was not the only guy who believed this. The Inner Ocean also tracked down a boy named Charlie Brown. Well, he was a man, Charles S. Brown. I just wanted to call him a boy named Charlie Brown. Uh, He was a teller at a Chicago City bank, lived at 61st and Wallace, about two blocks away from the castle. And he had some dealing with Holmes, too. There's a lawsuit on file from him for suing Holmes on the non-payment of a $50 promissory note. And what he said is, I never believed that Holmes was hanged. I firmly believe that the execution was a trick and that Holmes is alive today. My reasons for doubting the hanging at the time were twofold. I thought the press report suggested something fishy in the first place. There was no autopsy held, and there were few spectators. There was a strange absence of details of the hanging in all the papers I saw, when you consider how great a stir the Holmes case had created, and last of all, the body was handed over to Holmes' friends almost as soon as it was cut down. No, I have not seen any letters dated since the hanging from Holmes, but Roderick Latimer can tell you the name of the man who received them. Latimer has told me that when that he saw them himself and recognized the writing. I was ticket seller at the Wall Street Depot for three years and knew Holmes in a neighborly way from the time he became a clerk in the drugstore opposite. I think, and I regarded him as a very bright fellow. I saw him progress, progress in the community and never did believe he was capable of murdering in cold blood. He was a schemer, and his swindles were ingenious. Many of them, however, were started in good faith. His gas machine, for instance. After he found his gas manufacturer was a failure, he probably tapped the main for the purpose of swindling somebody to recuperate himself for his outlay. This is an interesting thing. Holmes had this whole thing at one point where he said that he had invented a new kind of gas. And really, he was just uh, tapping out of the regular old gas man. He actually pretty well defrauded the gas company with it. You do have to take your hat off to a guy who can defraud the gas company. So this is a fascinating document, this newspaper article, if for no other reason at all than the fact that it shows what some neighbors and uh, old acquaintances of Holmes were thinking about him a couple of years after his death. And when the article came out, it did inspire some heated discussion around Englewood, enough so that they had to follow, publish a follow-up the next day where they interviewed more neighbors and people who knew Holmes. And here's what they said. C.B. Scales, a druggist at 63rd and Halstead, said, That story is a wonder, and while it seems improbable, it must be remembered that Holmes did a great many things that would seem impossible. His career is only another proof that truth is stranger than fiction. G.A. Boggart, a jeweler a few doors down from the castle on 63rd, said, It appears to me that the story is a little too well put together for having been invented by Robert Latimer. I would not be surprised. I knew the man, and he was capable of carrying through anything in the way of a scheme or swindle. He was audacious enough to attempt anything. Now, from there, they actually moved down to the castle building itself. The castle was still there at the time. A lot of the reports say that it burned to the ground in 1895. That's not exactly true. There was a fire there in 1895. The top two floors had to be rebuilt, but the building itself was still there. And really, the uh, there's really not a photograph of what the building looked like when Holmes was there. The, fo- the photograph that goes around, the one of them from Holmes' lifetime, it had, been, it had been rebuilt quite a bit before then. Uh, there was a big fire there in August of 1893 that Holmes used to try to get the insurance. So after that, they put up this weird temporary roof on it, which is what you see in the photographs. What it looked like while Holmes was really operating there is uh, really kind of a question mark. But anyway, uh, they they went into the building. The first floor still had the uh, drugstore and also the restaurant. Inside of the drugstore was, uh, I guess they were now calling it, according to this article, it was called the Castle Drugstore now because it was the old Holmes Castle building. And they ran into C.E. Davis, the guy who was the jeweler at the time, the guy who had been at the jeweler while Holmes was there. And also while they were investigating the castle, C.E. Davis was always ready with a good quote. Um, I love it when I run into C.E. Davis in one of the articles. And here's what, uh, they talked to him about Latimer's story, and he said, 
said that Latimer had always said that Holmes wasn't really hanged. Even the day after it happened, he had run into Latimer and said, no way. But here's what Davis said. He said, Holmes is good and dead, and I have talked with men who saw him strung up. Latimer is windy and always ready to tell wonderful, wonderful stories if he can find a good listener. Nothing that could convince me that Holmes is on earth except seeing him and hearing him speak. Now, meanwhile, there was a guy, W.M. McKenzie, who was running the restaurant in the building over next door. Um, he was always quoted as saying he didn't buy it. Um, he said, I was an officer for 17 years, and I don't believe prison officials could be found who would dare to take such risks. At the same time, I don't believe Latimer could have spun the entire yarn out of his own imagination. Somebody must have helped him. So at this point, there's nothing left for us to do but look at the case. The basic body switcheroo does not sound necessarily impossible. It sounds like the kind of trick any stage magician could pull off without too much trouble. As to bribing that many people, including a couple of priests, that's a little bit more of a trick. Though it is probably worth noting that one of the priests was uh, found dead under somewhat mysterious circumstances a couple of years later. He was found like lying dead and bleeding from the face. Official story came to be that he had had some kind of... I, I forget what it was, like an aneurysm or something, and just fallen in the bleeding was because he fell and hit his head. Um, but other people said that he was, you know, beaten to death by a couple of thugs. So, the basic switcheroo doesn't sound entirely impossible. Bribing that many people sounds a lot a lot worse. It's worth noting that these letters Latimer claimed to have seen apparently never materialized. And when asked, he couldn't remember the name of the guy who had the letters, which is kind of a red flag. But that was also kind of Latimer's stock and trade. Um, when they first found him, they were uh, looking for a house Holmes had lived in, apparently with Minnie Williams, that was at 66th and Halstead. And Latimer told them, oh yeah, when I was working for Holmes, he did have a house where some woman was living. Um, it was around there. I don't know exactly where. But I could point it out to you. I don't know if you ever did point it out to him. But what remains here really is to look at the execution stories. There were several witnesses who attended and wrote up a port reports of it. Uh, they differed a little bit in details. Like Holmes said something like, take your time, I'm, no hurry. I'm in no hurry when they were tying him up, and goodbye right before he was executed. But articles differ on the exact wording. Uh, some of them also report him saying, don't bungle, but mostly not first-hand accounts, I don't think. I'm not sure if that's in any of the first-hand accounts. And Holmes did have a beard in prison that he shaved down to his more famous mustache right before the hanging. I don't think there's a photograph of him with a beard. There's a lot of drawings of him that were made when he had a beard. But on the scaffold, he did, he did appear <coughs> without the beard and make a little speech clean shaven before the hood was put on. So having a bearded corpse wouldn't have done any good. Uh, now, anyway, there are a few papers that I'm sure had reporters. It gets a little bit tricky. With a lot of the accounts, I can't really tell which of them were actually there and which of them were just uh, reporting things that were reported back to them. Chicago papers published very detailed accounts of the hanging, but I'm not sure they actually had anyone present. Uh, but the Philadelphia Inquirer certainly did. The Philadelphia Times certainly did. Uh, the New York World published a drawing of Holmes on the scaffold with a crowd around. It had a really detailed account. Uh, it's, not, it's worth noting that the New York World, though, is not the most reliable paper in the world. In fact, they're, honestly, they're probably the ones who made up the whole idea that Holmes was luring World's Fair patrons to his hotel. Uh, they weren't in town. They weren't actually investigating the case firsthand. They wouldn't have known that what, what he called a hotel was, you know, little more than a paper mache f facade built up to put to, to fraud investors. Uh, we'll cover all of this in another time. And if you want to, there's a, you know, anyway, the New York World published a drawing of Holmes on the scaffold. And it matches, uh, very closely matches the one that was in the Philadelphia Times. They put up a drawing of Holmes on the scaffold as well. Uh, if you're watching the YouTube version, I'll put those up right about at this time. It's also, if you check the webpage, I have both of those up. And this, uh, these drawings of the scaffold is where Latimer's version really falls apart. Uh, first of all, the thing about the body being raised up, not dropped. That was a real method of hanging sometimes. They did it in Chicago a couple of times in the 1850s. But as near as I can tell, it was not the standard at Moya Mensing. As near as I can tell from double-checking all the other accounts of hangings, it was just a regular trapdoor the body fell, like you would normally picture a hanging. Uh, the biggest thing here is that Latimer's account talks about there being some kind of partition blocking people from what was seeing what was going on underneath the trap door. And we can see from all the drawings of the accounts that that was not the case. They could see right beneath the scaffold very well. From the time the noose was attached to the time the body was taken down, there was no time the body would have been out of sight. Uh, several people present commented on the ghastly noise that the trap door made, which was something they dealt with a lot back then. In, in Chicago, they actually modified the trap door on the scaffold so it wouldn't make a big noise at one point. Apparently, they hadn't advanced that far on Moya Mensing. It was a very noisy trap door, and there were a number of people there. It was a small number compared to the sheer number of people who wanted to 
come. But the uh, number of attendees that Holmes is hanging was only in the range of about 75 people. So Latimer's account doesn't really hold up here. There's no way they could have had two guy, two prison officials and a dead body hidden beneath the trap door. Not to mention the smell of the body. That's not the kind of thing you could have gotten past people. But I'm only too happy to include that there are some butts here. Holmes was hanged in a hood, as was standard of all the hangings, and the body was quickly covered in cement, something Latimer apparently didn't know, and there was no autopsy beyond a cursory examination showing that the neck was broken. And I can't really, so I can't really determine also whether they actually took off the hood before they poured the cement on it. So if we take it on faith that Holmes could pay off the priests and the lawyers and the jail officials, one can't imagine that um, a good magician could manage this sort of trick, even without you know the guys hidden down below. And like I said, I love a good fake death theory. Why not dig him up? Uh, I may not think Holmes was nearly the supervillain he's made out to be. I think he was exaggerating when he said he killed 27 people, not leaving hundreds of them out. But you know, like I often say, when the rumors get wild or we start like you know talk about violating Holmes's peaceful slumber. It's not like we're besmirching the honor of a good man here. He did kill several people. Uh, what kind of shape the body is in? It's just something I'm very curious about, too. A lot depends on what kind of filler materials were in the cement. But, you know, I say, let's do this thing. So anyway, this has been Mysterious Chicago with Adam Seltzer from Mysterious Chicago Tours. Uh, we have a public homes tour coming up this weekend. Once again, there are a few spaces remaining. We'll, we'll announce more of them soon. And private homes tours, which I, I do those a lot. They're available all the time. MysteriousChicago.com will get you all the details. I'm going to news about a Holmes book to announce very soon. I'll be spending a whole winter working on one of those. I don't think anyone's really done an accurate book about Holmes and his career yet, so that's how I'll be spending my winter. Once again, swing by Mysterious Chicago. Get on our mailing list. Subscribe to the podcast for more of history at its coolest. Now take it away, Stips Incorporated.